Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. Um, a couple things about that I've noticed about COVID. I mentioned the, the loss of smell, the loss of taste. Um, it, it does, at, at, that affects your appetite uh, greatly. And I, I noticed, I think it's altered my taste buds to some extent. You know how sometimes you don't like something and then one day you wake up and you're going, I want to try that, and you like it all of a sudden. And um, kids, it won't be hot dogs and pizzas and hamburgers the rest of your life, I promise you. Yeah, you'll be wanting green beans one of these days, and you'll be going, oh my goodness. So anyway, um, yes, sir. Yeah, I hear you. So anyway, but it altered, um, I think it's altered some of my taste buds, and there's some things I just don't want anymore. I, there's a favorite cereal I used to eat all the time. I hardly touched it uh, since I got sick. And um, one day Lisa asked me, she says, is there anything you want from any place? Because she knew I wasn't eating. And uh, it was starting to worry her a little bit. And um, I said, you know what? I've got a, like a craving for a mushroom. So she got me a Hardee's mushroom Swiss burger and I've been eating them every day now yeah I'm like hooked on them so I'm like craving or what is it Carl's Jr. in some places anyway I've been craving those uh, thick burgers I'm gonna stop and get one on the way home today anyway Revelation chapter 1 uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer Father we ask your blessing on your word today and we love you and we thank you for allowing us to be here today bless all of those watching online, all of our church family everywhere. Lord, just open up your word to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Revelation chapter 1, let's pick it up in um, verse 10. Uh, there's been something I wanna, I've been wanting to show everybody for a while, and I just keep adding and adding and adding to what I see in Revelation chapter 1, and I knew it was going to do, I knew I was going to do this because I just, I can't help myself. If I, if I see something in the Word of God, boy, I just want to get into it and let's, let's taste it and see if, it, if it's good or not. But anyway, uh, John starts, really starts this out midway in the chapter, uh, chapter 1, and he starts telling the story of what happened. And he said, verse 10, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, I heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. Now he's on the Isle of Patmos, and he's been put there because he got, he's preaching the gospel. And the tradition tells us, we don't really have this in the scriptures anywhere, but we know he was on the Isle of Patmos because, and because he says, for the, for the word of God. So we know he was there in exile. And the, the historical story is that J.R., they tried to boil him in oil. That was a punishment that they gave to people was they would have a big pot full of tar and people that they were going to punish, they would throw in there to kill him. Well, it didn't kill him. And, uh, and, and if you remember, when Jesus was sort of giving out blessings to the disciples there before you know, and Peter's like, okay, you gave me mine, Lord. What about John? What are you going to do for him? And he said, if I'm going to have John tarry until I come, what is that unto thee? And so John, from what we can see, lived out, was the only apostle, lived out a natural life. Died somewhere in the mid-90s, and he was probably somewhere in the mid-90s in age. He was probably born about the same time as Jesus, and uh, he was way up in his 90s, and he probably died a natural death, died of natural causes, sort of like Moses did. They tried to kill him, didn't have any effect. I don't know how he got out of that. I don't know if I'd want to, I don't know if I'd want to die in a vat of oil or live through a vat of oil. I don't know. But anyway, he lived through it. 
God blessed him, so he's on the Isle of Patmos because of the word of God. They wanted him out of the way. They wanted the preacher gone, and that's sort of how things were at the time. And um, I know some people that want us gone, amen? But anyway, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, which means he was praying. He was praying. He was probably meditating on Scripture that he knew or Scripture that he had. But he was having church on the Lord's day by himself. Nothing wrong with that. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. There's something else I might just throw in here next week. Saying, I am Alpha and Omega the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book, and then send it unto the seven churches. So not just the words that Jesus dictates to John is what he's supposed to send to the seven churches, but he's also supposed to, and that's what he did, he wrote down the vision that God gave him, starting in Revelation 4, where he's carried up into heaven, he sees the throne of God, and, he, and then he sees the, the book and the seals and the seven trumpets blowing and the seven vials of wrath poured out and Jesus coming back in, in Revelation 19. He sees all of that. He sees new heaven and new earth and new Jerusalem. He gets to see all that and write it all down. Okay? And, um, and that's what I think Jesus meant. If, if, if he's to tarry until I come. Well, Jesus showed up in John's house. So he tarried until Jesus came and, and visited with him. But anyway, he was, he was to write everything down in a book and send it to those seven churches. And he said, send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. Well, we know what those represent from the Old Testament law. We know that that represents the seven spirits of God. We're going to see later on when we get to Revelation 4, we're going to see the, those, those candlesticks and, those, and that they represent the seven spirits, uh, which are mentioned in Isaiah chapter 11. And also the fact that they are, we're going to find out they represent these seven churches. So... Uh, turn to see the voice that spake uh, with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, girt about the paps with a golden girdle. It was just sort of a, a, a mid-wrap that they had, like a big belt or something like that. That's something that they just used to bundle their... They're robed together. They called it a girdle, which it was, okay? Uh, but it was, a, it was a golden girdle, and it was girt about this area here, holding his robe together. And the Bible says, And his head and his hairs were white like wool, white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. And I want you to think about that. And his feet, like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And notice this in verse 16. He had in his right hand seven stars. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. You see that in Revelation 19. There's a connection there. What Paul said, that the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. So he's referring to the, the word of God, the Bible that comes, out of, comes forth out of his mouth. And then I want you to notice... His countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. So here's John. He turns around to see, and there's Jesus, there's the seven candlesticks. And there's Jesus in the midst of them. Very important, because I'm going to show you something about the universe. And Jesus standing in the midst of those seven candlesticks. He's got seven stars in his hand. How do you do that? How do you hold seven stars? Jesus can do it. So, and then his face is just shining like the sun in his strength, like at full noon. And verse 17, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand, and this is not slain in the spirit. 
has nothing to do with being slain in the Spirit. Slain in the Spirit is an unbiblical doctrine, not mentioned anywhere in the Scripture. The fact that John, being physically overwhelmed with seeing the presence of Jesus Christ and His glory in His room, in His house, I guarantee you I would have passed out. And that's basically what we're looking at here. The, the overwhelming of his flesh. The reason why God never chose to never make an appearance to people publicly was because of his glory. And he tells Moses, you can't, you can't stand to see my glory. You can't stand to see my face because it'll kill you. So here, just Jesus, the Son of God, standing there in that room was enough to overwhelm the senses of John, and he fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Let me just ask this question. Have you ever heard the idea that Jesus, when he died on the cross, went to hell and took custody of the keys of death and hell? Have you ever heard that one? You ever heard that before? Well, let's see, you ever heard that one? Anybody? I have. Heard it probably dozens of times, okay, from people. I have absolutely no idea where they got that from. No idea. I do not see any place in Scripture where Satan had the keys to death and hell and wouldn't give them to back to God. So Jesus had to die or he had to shed his blood or he had to go to hell and he had to beat the devil up. And let me tell you something. The devil right now is not in hell. He's not there. Okay? So I don't know. It, I've heard that before. I've heard preachers talk about it. I have no idea where that idea comes from. It would be something to study it out and find out the source of it. I just don't buy it. I don't believe it. He said... Um, I, I'm alive forevermore and have the keys of hell and of death. Well, we don't see any place in Scripture, again, where Jesus didn't have them, where he lost them, or he had to go regain them, or even the statements that Jesus himself made about what was going to happen. He, he told all his disciples, I'm going to be scourged, I'm going to be beaten, I'm going to be mocked, I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to die. Three days later, I'm going to rise from the dead. He's, I'm going to go into the lower parts of the earth. Uh, I will go to the heart of the earth. I will be like Jonas was. Be down there three days. I'm going to come back. And I'm going to set captivity free. I mean, he told all that stuff. But he never said anything about regaining the keys of death and hell. My thing is, he's had them all along. Okay? Now, I want to throw something in here. <clears throat> because... There's a, lot of, there's a lot, and believe me, in the last three weeks, I haven't felt like studying nothing. So people ask me, did you watch the debate? What debate? Oh, there was two of them. I missed both of them. Yeah, have you seen, have you seen this and this? And I, have, I have not, I just barely felt like getting out of bed. But anyway, I know that there's a lot of stuff on the internet about COVID medicine, COVID vaccines, COVID this, COVID this, COVID this, COVID this. And a lot of people are making a lot of hype out of anything that is a possible drug to treat COVID. Um, I know that when, I know that Trump became COVID positive, he went into the hospital. They gave, there was a, a company called Regeneron that made, and I did the research on this last night, they made what's called an antibody cocktail. That's not like a martini cocktail. 
It's a group, it was previous medicines that they already had. And antibodies are basically just, your body has them in it, and they are what the body uses to attack either bacteria or viruses. It's the white blood cells, okay? And the antibodies, once they attack something, they remember it. They remember what it is, they, and they keep a record of it, so that if it, that's why if you ever get the mumps, you're not ever going to get the mumps again. Because your body remembers and it makes these antibodies against the mumps, whatever the mumps is, and it stores that in your body and you can be around people with mumps all day long and you're not going to get it because your body knows how to fight it off. And there's a lot of good Bible illustration to that. Well, there's been accusations that Trump got his DNA changed and this and that and the other, and that's not true. Because when you get antibodies given to you the way he had it given to him, those antibodies were, were designed to attack, number one, the COVID virus. Number two, they were designed, and this was what's neat, they were designed to inhibit, what did they call it? Um, they were designed to keep the COVID virus from changing its appearance so that it could escape because viruses have the ability to do that. Once they realize that they're under attack by the body, these, some of these viruses can change appearance. You think about that, okay? There's all kinds of stuff going, oh, wow, that's cool, okay? And that's how they escape. The body, knowing and, and or, you know, whatever vaccine they come out with this year for the flu won't work next year because the virus will change. It'll transform. It'll transmutate itself so it's not recognizable. So anyway, that's what Trump received. He got one dose of it, and the next day he was 100% better doing interviews and everything like that. It's amazing. So after doing the study and the research, on that, unless there's something that I haven't found out yet, uh, if they would have offered that to me, I probably would have taken it, because I'm telling you, I have never been as sick as I have been these past few weeks. Never in my life have I been this sick, and I didn't have the full effects of what COVID was. I didn't have the body aches that go along with it. Um, I was just drained physically, couldn't do anything, could just anyway. But I've never been that sick before. And, of course, Brother Wayne, it took his life. And so, if there is a medicine out there, God bless it. Now, here's why I'm saying this. Yes, I've told people to watch out for things that alter human DNA. But, let me say this, okay? How many churches just on a percentage, how many churches don't use the King James Bible or any Bible from the true vine anymore? 90%? Let's say 90%. Okay? The devil has done everything he can to eliminate the words in this book, which is God's DNA. Okay? But he can't. He can't. He's tried everything in the world. He will continue to try to eliminate this book from this world, to alter it, to change it, to, get, to take things out of it, to cause it to be wrong somehow, some way. Okay? Now, he would like to have access to what's in this book to change it, but it's sealed. And who is the only one who can unseal this book? The Lord Jesus Christ. He's the only one. Okay? So, I'm not, I don't get all worried about some company. And yes, this particular company is working just like every other pharmaceutical company in the entire world getting the license to be able to use CRISPR to alter DNA. The thing is, it is not easy 
to alter the DNA of a, of a, of a living being permanently. It's not easy to do it because wh whatever living thing it is, let's say it's me, if my, my DNA gets altered every single day, pollutants in the air, sunlight, solar radiation, things I eat or whatever, those hearty sick burgers probably do it, they damage my DNA, but my body has a built-in mechanism to repair the, the damaged DNA and to get rid of it, to get rid of the, the bad DNA, throw it out, get rid of it, and rewrite it so that it's been corrected. And that's this. It has the ability to stay preserved. So my DNA gets changed tens of thousands of times every single day, but when I go to bed at night, I still have the same DNA as I did when I was born. Okay, now that's, and I'm trying to say this to people, to not give yourself over to fear. Okay, don't give yourself over to fear that everything that's coming out right now is the mark of the beast. That's YouTube hype. And I refuse to do it. Okay, so it's, not, it's just not that easy. Remember, there is coming a time when I, I believe everybody's DNA is going to be altered. Who's holding the key to that right now? Jesus Christ is. At some point, he's going to yield it over. Okay? But he hasn't done it yet that I know of. We still got some things, I think, before we get to that point. So anyway, I just want to throw that in um, for whatever it's worth. I, I, I just, I don't like to see people living in fear of everything they see on the internet because you get overloaded with it and you think everything now that's out there is going to kill you, it's going to, it's going to alter your DNA, it's going to give you the mark of the beast and you're not going to know about it. People, God's people are going to know. Now, if you're not God's people, you should be scared. I want you to be very scared. But if you're God's people, don't give it another thought, okay? God will take care of you. God will make sure you are right. Now... Uh, he mentioned that his face, his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Turn to Exodus 34. Uh, my father-in-law is still in the hospital. Now, uh, we heard that he is post-COVID meaning that he is no longer under COVID quarantine. He's still having some problems breathing. Um, but if, if they were to offer that to him and he would ask me, should I take it? I would say, yeah, give it a try. Uh, I'm just not, I'm not, I'm, I don't live in fear. Remember what Jesus told us. He said, you shall take up serpents. You tread on scorpions. If you drink poison, it won't, it won't affect you. Okay, Jesus made promises to us that he wouldn't let that happen to us. Amen. He made those promises to us. And people, abide in his promises, abide in his word. And not in YouTube and Facebook, unless you're going to watch Bethel, all right? Anyway, Exodus 34, verse 29, it came to pass. And here's a picture of it, Old Testament picture of what happened in John's house. It came to pass when Moses came down from Mount Sinai. Now he's coming down from heaven. With the two tables of testimony in Moses' hand, when he came down from the mount, that Moses wist not that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't see his own face shining. Um, and when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, I would be afraid. I would go running. They were all afraid and came nigh him. Moses called unto them, and Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned unto him. And Moses talked with them, and afterward all the children of Israel came nigh. And he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him in, in Mount Sinai. Until Moses had done speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. Why? Because his face was shining so bright that they couldn't bear to look at Moses' face. Moses is a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ. 
Here we have the lawgiver coming down with the book in his hand. That's what you're going to see by the time we get to Revelation 10, I believe. Here's the angel with his face shining like the sun with the book open in his hand. Okay, So I think this is a foreshadow of that. And verse uh, 33, until Moses had done speaking with him, he put a veil on his face. But when Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he took the veil off until he came out. And he came out, spake unto the children of Israel, that which he was commanded. And the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone. And Moses put the veil upon his face until he went in to speak with him. Now I want you to get this scene. Moses has tried to come down the first time with the tables of stone in his hand, two of them, the Old Testament, New Testament, the first coming, second coming, first witness, second witness. I mean, you have all that there. Uh, DNA, the, the crystal structure of DNA is, is like the tables of stone. So when Moses comes the first time with the law of God written down, Israel's down there, having, they're, they're breaking every one of those laws. Moses casts them to the ground, they, they're broken, and Israel still doesn't have the law. They don't have a covenant. So now Moses has to do this again. He comes the second time. That's a picture of the second coming. And he comes down again. This time, when, whenever there's light, there's revelation. Something is revealed. But... A couple of things are working against the Israelites here. Number one, Moses stutters. Moses is hard of speech. They can't understand Moses and the way that he talks because he has a speech impediment of, of some kind, whether he stuttered or he spoke like <laughs> Sylvester, okay, or whatever it was, he had a speech impediment, had a problem. And so they couldn't understand him that way. And then they asked him to put a veil over his face so that that light did not shine on them. They're still in darkness. Okay? And so now he's reading them the word of God that God gave him. And they can't see the glory of it. They can't understand the wording of it. They don't know who that is there. It's a mystery to them. So... 2 Corinthians 3, turn there very quickly and then we'll close out and get ready for the next service. And by the way, that'll be it for today. I'm going to go home and go lay down again. I'm winded already. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7. Lisa said she could hear me during the funeral Friday. I was not in too good a shape. I was very, 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 very weak. And she sent me it. She said, I can hear you breathing <sighs> like that. So anyway, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7. But if the ministration of death, he's talking about the law. The Old Testament law was the ministration of death, the ministry of death. It brought death. Why? Because nobody could keep what was written there. Written and engraven in stones was glorious. So that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses. You know, what that, you know what that means, don't you? It's like, Callie, you go out in the parking lot there and you look up and you can look at the sun for how long? Two seconds. One, two. You can't keep looking at it. It hurts. It just, you turn away from it. Okay? And think of that, think of that reaction. Here's Moses, the lawgiver, the bringer of the covenant the, with the mercy of God. But they look at him and they turn away from him because he bears the glory of God on him. Okay? And um, John didn't have a problem with it. If you go back and read that, John said, I saw his face shining, you know, as his, his countenance shining as the sun in his strength. John didn't have a problem with that. He, he didn't go, I can't take this. He was enjoying it. Okay? So anyway, um, amen. How shall, verse 8, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? 
and he's saying more glorious. Like the two, the two lights on, on, on the day four of creation, the two lights, greater light and the lesser light. The greater light's the sun. Lesser light would be the moon, the stars. So when it comes to the, this book, the greater light is the New Testament. The lesser light is the Old Testament. And he's talking about that here. He said if the administration of death was glorious, then and that glory was to be done away. How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? In other words, more glorious. So, as bright as Moses' face shone, it eventually went away. But Jesus' light stays forever. Okay? And it's brighter. So, verse 9, If the ministration of condemnation be glory... Much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelleth. For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. Seeing then, and he's talking about the Old Testament, Old Testament done away. Because a new covenant is in place. And he says... Verse 12, seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech and not as Moses. See, there it is. Paul saying in the New Testament, that's why when we, you know, if you're going to lead somebody to Jesus, you're going to talk to them about Jesus. Is there a Deuteronomy road that we walk people down to show them how to be saved? Is there one in Leviticus? No. It's Romans. For all is sin and come short of the glory of God. For the wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. For you know, God so loved the world. That those verses are easy to understand. I got it when I was nine years old. I got it. I didn't understand it the way I get it now. But I got it. Okay. So anyway, he said, We use great plainness of speech and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. But their minds were blinded. And it's the same way today. Love the Jews, but they are the enemies of the cross and they're blind. Okay? And you know what, you know what we're not supposed to do? Put a stumbling block before someone that's blind. We're not supposed to do that. And Israel's blind. Okay, so anyway, there, verse 14, their minds were blinded for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. The Jews have their Shabbat service. They had it yesterday. And they all went into their service and they had a man who comes out and he brings this big Hebrew scroll out. He's got this little pointer thing and it's got a little finger on it. And he's reading the Old Testament, reading the Scripture, the Word of God. I was at an airport, Washington, D.C., and was there in the, in the same area that I was sitting was a Jewish rabbi. And boy, I wanted, I wanted so bad to go talk to him. I didn't know what to say. I figured if God was in it, he'd lead me to say something. But I wanted so bad to talk to him because he pulled out his, his Bible. And he's reading his Old Testament. I don't know what he was reading. It was in Hebrew. But he was reading it. And I prayed for him. God, open his eyes. Open his eyes. Let him see. Let him, let him understand what it is he's reading. But there's the veil. There's the veil. And they cover their heads. Okay? Which we don't. So anyway, so it's all about covering and veils and everything like that. So, verse 15, but even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with open face, no veil, 
beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. From glory to glory. You have the glory of the Old Testament, now the glory of the New Testament. And we come out of the bondage of the law, and now we're under the covenant of grace by Jesus Christ, whereby all of our sins are forgiven. Somebody say amen. Amen. And we'll get into the rest later. Father, we love your word. We thank you for it. We pray that you'd bless it this morning. Bless these that are here. Bless these, Father, that are watching with us online. Bless our church. Father, give everybody their health back. Uh, give them their vitality back. Their, their walk with you, Father. Just bless them. And open back up the doors of your house, we pray. Lord, just bless this morning's service, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Take a break. I'm going to go sit down, drink my apple juice. <laughs>